He should be known by most Christians today for the Athanasian Creed. He was exiled five times by Roman emperors, including Constantine. I bring that up because the common notion that the empire became Trinitarian Christian overnight thanks to Constantine at Nicaea is really bogus history when you dive into it. Athanasius fought hard against the spread of Arianism, who were Unitarians in that they believed that Jesus was a created being. Very similar to beliefs to that of the Jehovah Witnesses today. He wrote quite a bit, but what many likely have heard is that he is the one who canonized the New Testament. However, all that his annual festal letter was, was simply a list of what books he and many others in the, in the church viewed as inspired. He wasn't the guy who banned 3 AD Gnostic works and all the other garbage that gets portrayed on TV or written in conspiracy books. Here's what he actually wrote. The heretics have fabricated books which they call books of tables, in which they show stars to which they give the names of the saints. The names of the saints is very likely referring to the Gnostic works that have the apostles and other New Testament figures names in them. Probably the most famous one is the Gospel of Thomas, namely because of the Da Vinci Code. The discovery of the Nagamani Library in 1945 is the main source of the extant manuscripts that we have today. Athanasius calls these books apocryphal and that the heretics tr try to trick the people by mixing them up with scripture as to make them appear on the same level. The key difference between them and the New Testament is that the 27 accepted books actually came from the eyewitnesses themselves. So, Athanasius wants to clear things up by clearly defining what books are divine by first listing the 22 Old Testament books that mirrors the same layout as the Jewish Tanakh, except that he includes the book of Baruch while excluding the book of Esther, but says that Esther is still a beneficial book to any believer, along with the wisdom of Solomon, Syriac, Judith, Tobith, the teaching of the apostles, also known as the Didache, and the shepherd of Hermes. And, of course, the same list of the 27 New Testament books that we have today. His whole point was to make clear what is accepted as scripture and what is not. It was never as if he was the judge and jury of what got in and what got kicked out. Now, for our purpose here, is that his work on the Incarnation is where we find his 70 weeks view. This comes in chapter 6, where he's basically geared at trying to refute the Jews who rejected Jesus as the Messiah. He said, But they shall be refuted on this supreme point more clearly than any other. And that not by ourselves, but by the most wise Daniel, for he signifies the actual date of the Savior's coming, as well as his divine sojourn in our midst. Seventy weeks, he says, are cut, upon, cut short upon thy people and upon thy holy city to make it complete end of sin and for sins to be sealed up and iniquities blotted out and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to seal vision and profit and to anoint a holy one of holies. So we have his verse 24 here and you can see that Athanasius has made point six clearly pointing to a person rather than potentially the temple. He continues on. And thou shalt know and understand from the going forth of the word to answer and to build Jerusalem unto Christ the Prince. And this is actually where Athanasius stops expositing on Daniel 9. So, he only quoted half of verse 25 and doesn't bring up verse 26 or 27 at all. So basically, this is his whole system. There are no dates, although he said the actual date is spelt out for the Messiah's coming as well as his sojourn on earth, which likely makes a person wonder, how can he think that this refutes non-believing Jews? Well, here's his rationale. In regard to the other prophecies, they may possibly be able to find excuses for deferring their reference to a future time. But what can they say to this one? How can they face it at all? 
Not only does it expressly mention the anointed one, that is, the Christ, it even declares that he who is to be anointed is not man only, but the Holy One of Holies. And it says that Jerusalem is to stand till his coming, and that after it prophet and vision shall cease in Israel. So, his proof is that the Mashiach Nagid and the Kadesh Kadesh are referring to the Messiah and that his arrival had to come during a time where Jerusalem was still around. So, the Messiah's coming had to have happened prior to the 70 AD destruction. Athanasius doesn't have a full-blown system here, but basically he is presenting his case as a matter of logic. What this is predicated upon is the defining of the Mashiach Nagid as the King Messiah. Another point that Athanasius brings up is the absence of new prophets in the land. What he is basically trying to say here is, hey look, Jerusalem, the whole Judean territory, and your people have been repeatedly defeated in all the attempted revolts against the Romans. So, First, there's not even a place for the Messiah to show up any longer in. And second, where are any of your new prophets of yours lately? Because it's been nearly 800 years since Malachi that God has risen one up in your eyes. Now, that is actually a good point for us to bring up when talking with a non-believing Jew, because we can still press them on this same point today. Because... God sent numerous prophets preaching mainly repentance for centuries, then essentially shut off the valve after Malachi in their viewpoint. But, come the first century, there's all of a sudden an explosion of a messianic expectation on the part of the Jewish people that fueled much of the three failed revolts. Even critics will say the same thing, but usually in their attempt to try to undermine the Christian viewpoint by saying something like, there were so many so-called messiahs walking around during that time, so the whole Jesus movement was nothing unique to its time. But, what this really does is beg the question of, why were the Jews expecting the arrival of the messiah then? It's as if they had something, or some book in mind, that was pointing them to this specific period in time. Just try to let that simmer for a while, because we will be coming back to that point in future videos. So, although Athanasius doesn't provide a full system, is that his historical point about the absence of prophets is beneficial to us when we share why Jesus is the messianic prophet that Moses said would come to the Jews. Reminder, hit the subscribe button below, turn on the notification bell, hit the like button, leave a comment, and don't forget to visit us at JustScripture.org. But in the meantime, stay salty.